Today is Wednesday, the 11th of October 2017. It is block height 489,275. And boy, have we got a shocker for you today. It's one of our favorites. Another country bans Bitcoin. Guys, talk to me. They banned it. They banned it. <laughs> I love it. I love it when Bitcoin gets banned. I get it's just, it just, it's frights itself and also for those of you who've been following me for a while i'm rocking the polo neck it's like the first time this year it's getting pretty cold here in berlin and uh so let's let's run through everybody we've got shinobi with us today yo 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 we got rick come in rick hey everybody it's sunny today not to be confused with the evil genius and uh Acnix. how you doing man hey guys what's uh what's going on you still on the road? Uh, not quite. Nah, just taking care of uh, some stuff with the vehicles, getting them prepped to uh, do a bigger trip this time. Cool, cool. Let's see, yeah, you can see it there. And uh, here with me, right next to me, is Shanine. Say hi. Hi. She's anonymous. She's kind of like just this voice. Think of her as like the producer of the show. In fact, that's actually what she is. She does a lot of fact checking. Um, of the stories and uh, just to remind you all that you can follow along with the show the links are in the description below and if you want to actually take part in block digest you can come and join us on bitcoin mumble the link is also at the top of that description right there and during the day we have an active and live news desk where you can participate contribute your stories and insights and even appear on the show if you want to so let's get started with putin i love putin he's one of my favorite scapegoats he is a political scapegoat every time something goes wrong he is to blame he wants to go first well i mean he's the kgb he's to blame for everything Did, didn't you know that they secretly uh run the world after they beat america in the cold war <laughs> yeah which, which news outlet had the best oh there you go had the best stock photo there you go that's what i want i don't want like some cheesy image of a physical bitcoin i want i want putin yeah i, I thought rick, rick, rick did a one. great job Rick did a great job of today's image. I will. Thank you. Thank you. Say yeah. That. I just like the idea, like these the bands, they happen so often. The miscommunication and translation, it seems to be always, everybody's trying to figure out what he said. Well, if you're going to have a scapegoat, what better scapegoat than a guy ride a freaking grizzly bear, right? <laughs> yeah, that's there, right. There. There's Rick's handiwork. Look at that. Brilliant. Okay, come on. Let's get into some substance. All right. So th this looks like it, it's following the exact same pattern that, that most people were calling with China, a except you know in Russia's case, I think it's been a lot more public in the the, uh, the internal governmental disagreements. You know, they've been fighting for like the past year and a half. Do we ban this? Do do we regulate this? Uh, how do we want to handle this? And, you know, they are starting to let the, that faction in the government screaming to ban it get louder again. But as we covered, you know, towards the end of the first season before we had our hiatus, there's been a lot of talk about regulating Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies in Russia. We've had the, the ICO uh, looked at as a method to fund mining operations. And this, this just seems to me like they're pretty much one for one pulling the same kind of shit that China just did. They're going to air quotes, ban it. But in reality, likely just set up a bunch of regulatory walls and select the exchanges or on and off ramps that they feel they can control and simply just try to gate your average Russian citizen out of being able to participate while integrating it at a larger level. And yeah, you know, well, I, I don't, everybody wants cheap coins. <laughs> Well, I don't, I don't know how seriously I take these, these, you know, threats of a ban again right after China now. It's like, what are you guys doing? Are you, what's going on here? Uh, I mean, how seriously, how seriously can you take this, right? Honestly, like the way I was looking at it is it's like a Russian market signal, kind of like the way Lloyd Blankfein from Goldman Sachs says that he was kind of neutral on the whole thing and that, uh, you know, folks were skeptical when paper money replaced gold and you hear these buzzwords that kind of ring in the Russian economy as far as money laundering, evading taxes, 
risky, used for crime. Like I'm not going to pretend that, you know, Russia's markets are all solid foundations and there's not a lot of that going on there already. And I'm pretty sure that, you know, this, like you're saying, I think it is restricting the on-ramps because uh, we see that, you know, they say that, you know, this is too dubious for retail investors, which like, yeah, to me, it just sounds like they're trying to limit on-ramps and also signal to the people that can buy to buy. I also like the way that um, the finance minister described cryptocurrency as a pyramid scheme. It's obvious that when a pyramid scheme grows in brackets, interest in this pyramid hots up with a high rate of return. And uh, so, and also, I noticed that John McAfee managed to get a quote in here. Did you see that? Is this him? This is him quoted here in, in the Zero Hedge article, right? Where he says, our income taxes are the greatest source of revenue. But if everybody's using Bitcoin, the government doesn't know what your income is. They can't tax it. And if you choose to say, I don't have anything, they cannot prove otherwise. That's a feature, not a bug, surely. And, yeah, I think he's um, he's finally starting to catch up with the, the realizations the, that a lot of us had years ago. <laughs> But then you know, it goes on to say the often outspoken eccentric McAfee did highlight the need for some regulation. However, preaching caution over the latest trend of government sponsored initial coin offerings. I mean, it sounds it sounds like he is broadly in favour, or you know, he's anti kind of government, right? In his stance here. Well, I mean, he's uh, I wouldn't call uh, McAfee a full on voluntarist or anarchist. You know, he's always just been kind of a hard streak libertarian. And, you know, it's not not everybody in this space wants to see government beaten completely out of existence. A lot, a lot of people just want to see it knocked back to a more manageable level. So, yeah, yeah. it kind of makes sense, especially with his uh, history. It looks like he's in favor of self-regulation here in this quote at the end. I do wonder why they went to him for a quote, though, um, about this. I don't know what special insight he has over Russia. He minds. <laughs> uh, okay, yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. Good point. All right. So, Bank of Russia, closure, Bitcoin crashing now. Not too badly, though. It's still holding up above 4700 4750 last I checked. So, yes. All right, let's talk about the big issue in the room. Today's title was going to be hashtag toxic, but we had to include the Russia story in there. Let's talk about the toxic community and one of the most toxic people of all. Who Now, now every time you hear Shinobi talk, I want you to think of Britney Spears and that song, Toxic. Shinobi, come on. Give me, give me some <laughs> toxicity. So this, like, I... I really am just flabbergasted at this because I, it's, do, do they have a legal team? Do, do they have any, any lawyers whatsoever that they're like bouncing these ideas off? Like, I, I have absolutely zero legal experience whatsoever. And just Googling a little bit, there are a half a dozen ways that they can have their pants suit off. Really deciding they're going to redefine a financial instrument or asset. I mean, uh, the definition of fraud in the factum, the, the legal definition, is fraud in which the deception causes the other party to misunderstand the nature of the transaction in which he or she is engaging, especially with regard to the contents of an instrument, parentheses, as a contract or promissory note, also called, or where called are you fraud not in the execution. Where, That's, where I forgot the exact place I got the definition. I have a tweet with it right now I just linked to, and I'll dig that up in a right. second. But okay. it's I'll it's, it's black and white. They are engaging in fraud to arbitrarily take one distinct financial asset and then try to pass off another asset as that. Where are their lawyers? Like, who did they run this by? to think that they can literally just defraud their customer base based on an arbitrary metric like the hash rate and just get away with it. Like it, it, it really boggles my mind. Okay, so let's rewind a little bit and let's go back to the center of this. So this is Zappo and they are stating their position on the upcoming Segwit2x hard fork. 
and they are saying that Zappo, in quotes, Zappo's policy in regards to hard fork is that when there is a fork, we always follow the chain with the most accumulated difficulty, and we will make the minority chain available to our customers for them to sell or withdraw from Zappo. In the next paragraph, they state, we are going to call the chain with the most accumulated difficulty Bitcoin or BTC. If the minority chain is one megabyte blocks, we're going to call that BC1. And if the minority chain is the one with two megabyte blocks, we're going to call that BC2. So let's start with accumulated difficulty. This is otherwise known as the longest proof of work chain. I haven't really heard it before with the, the accumulated difficulty, but it just means the most, which chain has the most thermodynamic power has having been contributed to it, how how much work went into to each chain. And we're going to back the chain that's had the most work, right? That's had the most thermodynamic, uh, you know, energy applied to it. The problem is they don't state when, they don't they don't state what, what might happen if all the miners, you know, go, start on one chain, that becomes the longest, and then they all shift over to the other chain, and that chain overtakes it at some point. They don't, they're not saying that. The second controversial thing that they're claiming here is that whichever one has the most accumulated difficulty or the most proof of work, they're going to call that Bitcoin. And the one that isn't, they're going to either call BC1, if it's only got a one megabyte block size, or BC2, in the case of Segwit2x, if that ends up being the minority chain. So that was what was controversial, just to make it clear. For and it's ridiculous, though, because, like, well, one, to nitpick a, a technical semantic, um, we've had one megabyte or greater blocks uh, being mined for a while now since Segwit adoption actually started taking up. And two, um, to decide that uh, the, the cumulative work weight of a chain defines what that asset is, is ridiculous because that can literally change at any time for, for any number of reasons. We, we could have one chain flip flop back and forth every day. And all, are, are they just going to start arbitrarily redefining what is Bitcoin every day? We could go through a month or two, uh, hypothetically, where where two x is the the cumulative um, most weighted chain, and then oh something changes and miners hop over, and then hey a week later it's another chain. Like uh, it, how are they going to try and apply that as the, the core of a definition of something when there is absolutely no guarantee on uh, almost any reasonable time frame that 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 will consistently stay the case. It's like we're, we're the definition is in a superposition, and we'll, uh, we'll just decide when we observe it. John, Andy, do you want to say something about the accumulated difficulty here? Yeah, I just wanted to point out that the standard by which we, uh, or the standard by which um, people should be judging which chain is legitimate it's based on longest cumulative difficulty and valid so yeah but, but how are we defining valid here that that's this is from mastering bitcoin as in whatever the, the majority of nodes term to be valid the majority so we're going with the democracy now i think i think I don't know. Like, so this is from Mastering Bitcoin by Andreas Antonopoulos. We're just trying to pinpoint the correct terminology. I usually say the longest proof of work chain because I believe that's from the white paper. And so I've just stuck with that. But yeah, longest cumulative difficulty is also OK. But when you introduce the word valid, that's subjective. That really depends well, yeah, on subjective because it's it's not it's you can look at it from, you know, your own node, whatever your node judges to be the most valid chain, or you can judge it at a network level as in how many nodes within the nodes that are available, how many of them um, make the determination that a given chain is more valid than another. Okay. I think the human, yeah, I just think the human, sorry, go ahead. Like f philosophically, like you, you can make the argument that, that your node decides what Bitcoin is. But when it comes to the, the larger scope uh, of trying to lay down an objective definition that, that especially uh, applies in the context of financial markets, I, I don't think that really cuts it. And I really think you, you have to boil it down to the most self-consistent definition that you possibly can and like really to do that i think we have to sit here and look that bitcoin nobody can debate that 
okay, so what, what is the starting point of Bitcoin? It is the blockchain that was initiated by the original client that Satoshi started. Okay, so we've started there. We've laid that as a foundation now. Bitcoin is the blockchain that fits within those rule sets to the point that every client from that original client up to the modern day and the most recent client it is valid by every client in between. And that, that is really, in my mind, the only self-consistent way you can try to define that outside that subjective scope of your node. And the minute you break from that, the minute you introduce a client that is not chain is valid as all of those other clients going back to the original, you have initiated a divergence. And th there is a gray area in there. There is that subjective aspect of, of what your individual node is running. But at the end of the day, when you break from that interoperability, are diverging from something. And you can sit here until you're blue in the face arguing about the subjective aspect of what your node is. But when you break that compatibility, you are breaking away from something. And it doesn't matter that that, that definition is subjective or gray. You, in breaking away from something that is Bitcoin, cannot philosophically consider that Bitcoin because the, the, the entire existence and nature of that thing breaking away from it is literally drawing its nature from the thing it's breaking away from, which is Bitcoin. Okay, but can I just point back to, to this announcement and, and try to get some clarity for the, the audience, which is that they're, they're basically, apart from the naming, I don't see that there's too much controversy here because they're going to give all their customers both coins on both sides of the, of the fork, if, there, if it turns out there is a fork, and they're going to let people withdraw. And they even say, you know, if you don't trust us, you know, take, take the coins off. If you do want to trust Zappo with the security of your coins and access the minority chain, there is no action needed on your part. We will take care of everything for you. So really, the only controversy I see here is that, that this, you know, relatively small business in, in the grand scheme of things is saying that they, they might call you know, the, the SegWit to X chain BTC in the event that it accumulates most difficulty, but they fail to define a time frame, which gives them wiggle room. That's what I read into this. I, I read that this is basically, I think this whole thing personally is a big bluff and I don't think they want to do it. I think they want Core to merge these changes in, but they're going along with it and they're putting out these press releases that are designed to, to apply as much pressure on the community as possible. But I don't. I, I see wiggle room here. I think that they haven't stated a time frame. They are going to give customers both coins on both sides of the chain. And personally, I don't really care if Sappo calls it, you know, pink coin. For all I care, I mean, it doesn't make a difference. It's just they're a relatively small player in all of this. I mean, yeah, I, I agree with your assessment. It's it's just like it, when it comes to really trying to define Bitcoin. Like, r regardless of, like, what Zappo's goal or intentions here are in doing this, like, I, I just, I really feel you do need to boil things down to that philosophical root that you can self-consistently build off of. And I don't think that just solely in a chain is a, a solid foundation from which to build off of. No, I think before you change a ticker symbol, okay, on um, any kind of currency, it requires industry backing. Like all the exchanges have to talk to one another. I mean, what do you think is going to happen on Bittrex, on Poloniex, where they've got hundreds of shit coins all trading against the BTC ticker? What are they going to do? Suddenly switch up those markets just because some debit card business decided that it was going to arbitrarily call segwit to x Bitcoin? No, of course not. Like you've got to talk to all the different stakeholders. It's a huge job from a technical perspective to, to change the key value pair in the database for, you know, in a ticker symbol. And once you've done it, you can't really reverse it. It's, it's a one way kind of thing. And the whole industry has to agree on it. So I, I don't think Zappo are going to go through. I don't even think the fork will happen personally right now based on the information I have. I just, okay. I just think everyone overreacted. I think they're playing us, man. I think they knew that people would react to this and people have reacted. Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, like you're saying, 
with uh, the definition of it all. I think these uh, these guys are really trying to go to the edge with this fork as far as like testing it to see if like uh, their definition can hold true as far as hash power. The price follows hash power, and you know, like uh, they're just. I think that it is a bluff, but it, you know, it's it's crazy to see them putting all this stuff out every day. Like, uh, what was that that one? Let me look this real quick. What does this statement say? Because it really just blows me away. You know, talking about. Uh, I'd like to point out that the only people that will have to upgrade are the people that run a Bitcoin core node while they are not miners, et cetera. Those individuals are doing it wrong anyway, which like there's like a total like what are the what are the nodes doing? then? I mean, like there's like this total like they don't understand the definition of Bitcoin. And, you know, like I think Shinobi saying with that, then that's the way I feel with it, too. Hopefully, you know, like we're saying, it'll just be a big bluff. Yeah, I don't really care whether it happens or not. I'm agnostic. I think Bitcoin's really strong right now. And uh, every time somebody announces they're going to fork it, the price goes up because everyone buys it because they want to get their, their free tokens. I mean, who would have thought that a few years ago? Act next, do you have any thoughts on this before we move on actually to a related story next? No, I was just going to go into valid proof of work explanations, but I think it's, it, it's uh, pretty self explanatory for a lot of people that, that you know, there's a set of eyeballs on it all throughout the course of Bitcoin's history, right? Like that data is not online, it's, it's uh, persisted to disk, but somewhere, somebody at all times had an eye on it, basically. So you have that form of proof of work too, the human aspect that's always been validating that constant work. And you're not gonna have that on a new chain. It doesn't just pop into place. Yeah, I think the valid chain is whatever you think it is. And it's valid so long as you and one other person agrees with you on the network, right? But in order for that chain to really work, in order for you to use it in any meaningful way, you need miners. And the more of these forks there are, the more SHA-256 coins there will be, the more competitions there will be for the same ASIC hardware. These aren't like GPUs. And that's going to introduce an interesting dynamic. Let's go to the next story, which is actually very much related to this. Um, which is a statement that I found quite shocking, and I did some nice, absurd, sort of ironic tweets about it. And uh, let me just quote Trace Mayer verbatim. He says, segwit 2 x developer explains your monetary sovereignty, announced with it and their plan to attack full node validation and private keys. So this was um, a, a message on the segwit 2 x mailing list from a chap called Tom... Sander, is it not from the Segwit? Where yes. is it from? It's, it says Segwit 2X, anyway. Um, that's the, that's yeah, so the, in, in any case, this is from a mailing list and, in which he says that basically, the vast, he says the vast majority of people use either SBB wallets or online wallets. They will just follow the longest chain. I'd like to point out that the only people that will have to upgrade are the people that run a Bitcoin core node while they are not miners, etc. Um, those individuals are doing it the wrong way, apparently. Um, so he says, instead of badgering the SegWit work group, I think a much higher rate of benefit can be reached by educating the people that run full nodes and explaining how they are not, in actual fact, helping the network. The simple fact is that if they didn't run these nodes, this whole discussion would not exist. That's quite a bizarre statement. So where, so Shinobi, where was this posted, just for clarity? Uh, sorry to drop the ball, but I'm not a hundred percent sure. I'd imagine it was the, the two X or the, uh, classic mailing list. Uh, it's usually where Xander spends most of his time, but like Tom is just, um, he's not exactly the brightest guy in this space. Like he, he's actually, uh, done, done a number of odd things like this in the past. Uh, for instance, anybody who is an Arch Linux user, um, they they maintain a Bitcoin uh, page on their Wikipedia. Me and Tom actually got into a little bit of an edit war uh, sometime last year when he was effectively trying to rewrite the entire page to paint Bitcoin Classic as the uh, the one true Bitcoin and try to mislead users into running that client without really appreciating what they were getting themselves into. I actually went through an entire um, shit fit with him and tried to introduce a 
a section on that page dealing with the nature of consensus. And, you know, I, I'm obviously a very staunch uh, Bitcoin core user and supporter. And I really took uh, an effort to stay as absolutely objective as possible. I did not inject my personal opinions into things. I simply tried to make clear to users that the network and the currency you are using is defined by the software you are running. And that it much explained the, the nature of non-mining nodes versus mining nodes, how things could potentially split into incompatible networks, just so people were aware that based on the software they were running, that might have implications for the other users or individuals they'd be able to interact with on the network. He, he pretty much fought so hard and so irrationally over this that the Arch uh, Linux uh, Wikipedia mods just removed any reference to any specific software client from that page. And in, in the process, he was literally contesting consensus as being the, the software rules that a, a client is enforcing essentially dictates what other clients you can interact with. He contested that. He attempted to say that Bitcoin miners only ran a, a single node, despite the fact that there are multiple mining pools out there that have a number of nodes spread across the globe to limit latency for individual hashers. He, 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 he effectively tried to argue against literally that should just be common sense, um, obviously true to anybody who's been in this space for a long time. And he just has a very long history of doing this. And he is just a very disruptive person that, that doesn't really understand how any of this works. He, he is one of those people who just thinks that whatever miners do, no matter what, that is Bitcoin. And a user's job is to just blindly follow miners. Would you and, say that he's you know, toxic? Would you say he's toxic? <laughs> okay. At, at so, risk of uh, having that flipped back at me, uh, yeah, I, I would. <laughs> All right, so, so he's toxic for Mr. Toxic himself. So I, I think we want to point out, first of all, um, this, this is the actual, um, it, the link is in the description below, but this is on the mailing list itself, and it's from the Bitcoin Segwit2x mailing list. And just to point out that he is a Bitcoin Classic developer, as pointed out by Peter Todd uh, here in this tweet, also linked below. And um, he's not actually a Segwit2x developer, but nevertheless, this was latched onto. I kind of got involved. And yeah, for me, that this idea that you would just sort of disempower yourself, and I'm, I use the word cuck, and I use it figuratively, not literally, um, the way some people interpreted it. I just mean that I think there are some people that enjoy outsourcing their independence, giving away all that power to, to other people. And they kind of like it when people abuse that power. There's almost this kind of weird, perverted fetish that people have where it's like, yes, please do cuck me, you know, please do, you know, take all my coins and have my private key. And no, I won't run a no, don't worry, you guys, I, you guys have got this, right? You got this. And I'll just let you make all the decisions for me. And then, I, I mean, I just don't, why don't we just go back to using Oracle databases? Why even bother using a blockchain? Why have mining? Why bother with mining at all if you're not going to have validation? I, I don't see the point of it. This whole argument it, it instills in the philosophy of the, this large group of people that are desperate to increase the block size, which by the way involves hard forking in all cases. So now I sort of see this as more like rather than trying to increase the block size, what you're really trying to do is just create a hard fork, right? Create a precedent for the development of Bitcoin. And I I just, I don't know what problem, I, I can't understand it. Why do they have a problem with people running what code they want to run and validating these blocks? That's the whole point of this project. Yeah, Shani wants I just to don't ahead. think they understand Yes. It. Like. Yeah, Shani, go, go. Yeah, so one of the things, uh, if you look at that tweet from Peter Todd, um, one of the things he was highlighting was that apparently this um, Tom Zander guy who made the post um, about Segwit2x is that he actually tried to do a pull request for Bitcoin Classic that would, uh, that was, it says it right there, that would only check signatures of blocks um, that were 24 hours or younger. So yeah, you can kind of see 
yeah, based on his history, like it's not that surprising. And actually, he uh, there's another link that is probably in the description about how he's been prior to this. He was supporting Bitcoin Cash, and he was actually he wrote a post on Reddit saying that um, that people should be going around and encouraging businesses and uh, merchants to accept uh, Bitcoin Cash. So he's gone from Bitcoin Classic to Bitcoin Cash and now Segwit2x, and it seems like a lot of the people involved in Segwit2x have done the same thing. So I thought that was interesting. Yeah, I mean, it really seems like a, a big number of the people pushing for 2x are simply doing so maliciously because they see a chance to disrupt Bitcoin with it and use that as a way to kind of usher people into Bitcoin Cash. And it's really ridiculous. Like I've like when I when I've tried to make the the argument, Chris, like with a lot of people on RBTC as to why running a node is important, why why validating things yourself is important. Like I cannot count the number of times that I've had people just evolve to get your shitty computer off the off the network. Your computer's a piece of shit. What can't you afford a better computer? And it, it's it really is just like an, an irrational anger that other people's like ability to afford things has to be taken into account. Like, like fuck all the poor people, like fuck anybody. If, if you can't spend 20 grand on a node, then fuck off. And, no, and like, it, it no, really no, no, no. Just that. I, I'm sorry. I have to correct you. It's fuck off. Fuck. Like F A C K. <laughs> You have to go well, why, back off. Why would you keep your uh, computer in in your basement? It's got to be in a centralized data center. You, you know that where there's just only a small number of data centers. There's a lot data of decentralization. Centers that, data centers that require biometric identity, like palm prints, in order for you to get in. Full KYC, the whole thing. But it That's really is ridiculous, and it's like you know. It, I have really yet to find somebody who can like come to me with a rational argument. It just almost always boils down to just emotional like outburst. It's I don't know what else to say beyond that. Okay, apparently he said piss off. I'm being told in the chat. So where did I? Get? Oh no, the fuck off came from uh, GQ magazine. He said it in that recording. That's where I got it from. Uh huh. So, You're right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So thank you very much to uh, Bremen for that correction. It was, in fact, run a $20,000 full node or piss off. Um, That's I some do quality make video sure. footage, the, uh, the, the GQ thing, though. I recommend watching that. Yeah, it's very good, yeah. And, um, okay, all right. So we've, we've quoted Satoshi correctly. Let's move to, to South America. Obviously, the, the message here is you should be running your own full node and you should run what software you, you want to either. I don't think any of us are saying like, you know, run Bitcoin Core. You should run the software. You should educate yourself, make sure you're well informed and then run the software that you believe will best protect your coins or whatever other uh, kind of decision you want to make. But let's move to South America uh, where there has been some decision on uh, the Segwit2x agreement that was signed and now maybe they're rethinking things. Rick, did you, were you the one I think introduced the story? Yeah, you know, we were just uh, following all these uh, Segwit2x statements as they come out. I'm sure we'll be getting more as these, uh, as this time goes on for the fork. And uh, this one is actually, I really liked it because it really did put it into perspective what some of these companies are getting whenever they say they signed or they agreed to this it, in this first paragraph it says on may 2017 we were invited to be for or against a phrase that read i slash we agree to immediately support the activation of segregated witness and commit effectively to a block size increase to two megabytes within 12 months period that was the, that was the new york agreement that they agreed to they didn't see this long form agreement that came out later so this is what they agreed to and they say go on to say that you know they're not pretending to be scaling experts and that they trust core and that you know they don't really have time for this sort of thing and and we know that they don't because south america is a place where they really are using bitcoin in, in places like venezuela where there's just awful things going on and they need some way to transfer value and so i think we're going to see a lot more just uh 
you know, straight reality reports coming out of South America and Latin America. And uh, this is what we're seeing here. It's just a small little statement that says, you know, what they agreed to. And uh, this really wasn't it. And uh, it does say that they are going to give their customers B2X tokens if, uh, you know, later on. Right. And it's interesting they point out that they don't currently see the support um, for the Segwit2x. We haven't seen the support. We don't like what we currently see on the BTC1 code repository in terms of technical considerations and open source collaboration. So another, per, another signatory drops out of Segwit2x of the agreement. And we're also hearing uh, increasingly that the people that signed it were not actually signing the full statement and it's as you say the long form content they are really only agreeing to this one sentence is that is that right yeah that's what we saw with uh one of the other guys that dropped out uh, i can't remember their name i think it started with a v and uh they said that they had agreed to just a one-line statement and then it later became this long form statement so this is right. like finally seeing that here okay monkey do you have anything? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, one thing. Like I, I, Rick touched on it is like we we've seen. I, I the name escapes me right now. I'm sorry, everybody. But the uh, the peer to peer lending business in uh, South America was one of the the first to withdraw from the agreement, and now uh, an exchange from Chile. Oh, South America is really one of the places where people are actually using especially places like Venezuela, where it has literally become the difference between being able to feed your family or not feed your family. And it just seems like, you know, as people are really starting to reconsider what they got themselves into, we're starting to see those first big withdrawals and statements against this coming out of the, the, the continent where people are actually using it where it is actually most intertwined with their physical well-being and health. And I, I think that, that like people really should step back and look at that for a second, especially people pushing for supportive of forks like this, that, you know, put a, a specific time to it. But a while ago, we really stepped past just being an experiment. Like there are people whose lives, livelihoods, their families actually depend on this now. And people need to stop treating this like a game. Like this is just a, a social media shit fest that they want to win. Like the, people's lives will actually be affected by how these events unfold. Yeah, I'm just showing here some of the, the, the past people that, that have... Uh, gone back on the, the NYA, it was uh, Wayne Loans that you were citing there, Shinobi, um, yeah. who pulled out. That's the one. And uh, we agreed to a sentence. And again, Rick, uh, thanks very much for your report on this. This is what you were talking about there. And on May, we agreed to a sentence to reach consensus for the good of the ecosystem. So it seems like people agreed to a single line, um, but then a full, you know, statement was put out and people just had their names put to it and now they're having second thoughts once they see the impact it's having on on the community so anyone else want to jump on this before we move on all right acnix well acnix is uh is up next let's move over to japan where we talk about no more nuclear japan's biggest utility turns to blockchain in power pivots that's uh, quite a headline by uh, Michael D. Castillo from Coindesk. So, Acnex, you there? This is yours. Yeah. You're up. Oh, all right. Uh, so this is kind of fun. Um, so, ERC-20 tokens for Japanese power crisis. Um, so, they have the meltdown reactor there, and it looks like TEPCO is looking to get into issuing some kind of uh, Ethereum token to try and eke a balance in their infrastructure here. Um, it looks like it could really potentially kind of uh, see where the market's headed in terms of nuclear power or renewable energy, and maybe work to kind of bridge uh, the gap there and create a better uh, infrastructure that deals with renewables as well as maybe get people more in line with nuclear power in the future 
So I think it's I think it's pretty interesting actually. Um, usually I'm like really leery of this type of thing, but I think in just the exploratory sense, it, it might be really interesting, especially in this like environment. Yeah, you know, I was actually uh, looking at this, and you know, I pay no mind to ICOs because you see them every day. But you know, Japan has fully legalized Bitcoin, and uh, Tepco is definitely a company I've heard of with that Fukushima incident. And, uh, you know, I could imagine they are looking for solutions. And this is one of the very, you know, rare ERC-20 tokens and ICOs where I see like them actually trying to do something. There's a real world problem they're trying to fix. And the people behind it are obviously got financial incentive to do so. And I imagine they'd be putting smart people on it. I've got to look more into the, the farther the development team goes. But this is like one of those judgment calls as far as ICOs go that, you know, it looks like this could be something, you know, this isn't just, uh, you know, uh, Paris Hilton tweeting about a coin. This is, uh, it looks like they're trying to fix a problem here and maybe this can do it. It's definitely an exploratory thing. They don't really make any guarantees that it's going to solve the problem. They're just exploring it and uh, it'll be interesting to see what they come up with for sure. Hmm. So one of the first sort of credible ICO offerings then. We haven't seen too many of those. Maybe, maybe. Yeah. Well, I'm oh, I'm I'm skeptical still, but I think, you know, if executed properly, yeah, potentially interesting. I mean, the look at the history of mistakes Tepco went and uh, went through, right? You, you know, I don't think they're going to want to mess this up. Yeah. Yeah, you're I right. mean, and especially I, oh, sorry. sorry, go ahead. <laughs> But like, especially with Japan, like, you know, nuclear power is something a, a lot of people get scared by, but it, it really is one of the most viable solutions, except for regions like Japan, because they really did engineer nuclear power plants to be able to deal with crazy types of disaster and structural stress. But Japan is just a, a very tectonically active like region of the world. And when it, when it comes down to it, like you know you might you might be able to build things up for like residences or traditional structures. but once you start bringing nuclear material into that, that's a, a lot more dangerous than it would be in a lot of other places. Well, I mean that's that's why I was so worried about um, their their reliance on the particular fuel types there. I, I mean, that was the bridge too far, I think, with TEPCO, and they, they knew that. So, you know, they kind of have to do their duty to, to prove that nuclear energy is, I guess, safe now, and it's a much harder battle. So um, this provides a marketplace to see where that's going to go, I think, potentially. But they, they really got to stick to their guns on this to, to execute it properly. Yeah, and I mean, like the the big issue is the like the like you said earlier, the, the actual infrastructure, and like the, if they move towards different power sources or, or hybridization of power sources, like you really have to kind of redesign the actual energy grid in order to handle like different loads or like different sources to distribution, and it's you know it's it's really good to see like even though it, it might be a little pie in the sky that people are actually looking at ways to re-engineer the infrastructure like that because it's something that has to be done sooner or later and that's why i was like uh you know whenever you said like maybe it's an ico worth looking into and i say maybe i i, I need to get off that like everything's a scam because i still have that like impulse reaction to ico or it's always a scam it's like wait a minute because there could be some real problem solved and it could be a, it could be a great thing you know so i'm i'm gonna keep my fingers crossed on it i would say everything is a scam until proven otherwise i just assume i use you know i assume everything with a little bit of dubiousness but i imagine if this is something that is formal is done as a corporation under a nation state there's going to be heavy kyc done on the entry you're not just going to be able to chuck coins at an address and expect to you know get in on this you're not going to be trading this on polo when polo as like the fomo dynamics engineers like constantly getting from every telegram chat room when polo when bitfinex when 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 am i going to make money when can i sell to a greater fool all right so that was it our second show of season 2x as we're calling it 
thanks very much for joining us. Have we got any final thoughts from the panel today? Just go out and enjoy your day if, or your night. Yeah, absolutely. Wait, so we didn't get TEPCO tokens to shill for, for a shill no, in that whole thing? Oh. Was no, oh. we, should have, we should have done that if we had been you know, smart on that we would have done an affiliate marketing deal with them. And we could have done like a whole pyramid layout and like, you know, people get, the guy at the top gets paid and everyone else down the chain has to find more and more, increasingly more friends in order to get them involved. We could have done that, but we weren't, we weren't oh, thinking. we're so wrecked. Yeah, yeah, we totally wrecked ourselves. But in the future, we will do that. We will definitely shill some ICOs for you and for your entertainment and for your edification. Right, Monkey, what you got? Any final thoughts? Just, uh, you know, keep your eye out on businesses you patronize for the next month, guys, because, you know, as, as a customer, it really is your job to hold them accountable or just deal with it. <laughs> yeah, and I saw a lot of spanking going on in the chat room today. I think you all liked my comment about cucks and people that like to be abused. No, <laughs> enjoy it. Well, that's great. I'm, I'm glad that you, you found that insight um, useful. Um, some people want me to go to Venezuela to prove that Bitcoin's even being used. Um, I love all the stuff you were saying about fake Satoshi with the pissing off and the bugger off. And yeah, that's great. Bugger off, you wankers, says Dan Bolsa. All right. Thanks. And, um, and apparently, Paula Green says that money was a way that, that radioactiveness could be spread around. So, the pe you know, people in Japan have to use cryptocurrency. I'm not sure how true that is. We'll have to do some fact checking on that. Shanine will get back to us and let us know if that's even true. And um, James Bond says, my, my quote of the day, this show sucks. Well, thanks very much. Don't forget to dislike the show um, afterwards. But if you did enjoy it, you can, of course, like and subscribe. But remember, only if you want to. Bye for now, everyone.